Again, good morning and welcome everyone. This is Kim Bailey with Alzheimer's Orange County and we welcome you to today's webinar, Resiliency and Coping Strategies for Dementia Caregivers. Uh, we are so pleased that you're here. Uh, these complimentary webinars are brought to you through an ongoing collaboration with our sponsors. Can you go back one slide? Uh, we want to thank O'Connor Mortuary, Care Choice Hospice and Palliative Services, Caring Companions at Home, Chatterton and Associates, the Wealth Management Team, and Alzheimer's Orange County. Again, my name is Kim with Alzheimer's Orange County. And we thank our sponsors so much. For, they provide these service or these webinars as a service to the community on topics that are beneficial for anyone who cares for and works with older adults. And we certainly hope that you find them informative and useful. We are absolutely thrilled to have Dr. Miriam Galindo with us today, once again, back by popular demand to present on this uh, important topic of resiliency and coping strategies for dementia caregivers. It gives me such great pleasure to tell you a little bit about our wonderful presenter today. She is Dr. Miriam Galindo. She is a licensed psychologist, licensed social worker, and registered nurse with over 30 years of, ex of experience working across all these settings, outpatient, inpatient, mental health settings. She holds a doctorate in psychology, master's degree in social work, and is currently completing a graduate degree in nursing at Vanguard University. And she shares a private practice with her husband, Dr. Jorge Galindo. Dr. Galindo, in addition to all of her professional experience, is also a former longtime caregiver for her late father, Henry, who, who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And we're proud to say she's been a volunteer for our organization since 2016. And so with that, uh, with deep gratitude, I'm gonna turn this presentation over to Dr. Galindo, who's gonna share her wisdom and expertise with us now. Thank you, Kim. Good morning, everyone. Boy, can I tell you what an absolute privilege it is to spend the next probably 45 minutes talking about one of my favorite subjects, and that is strategies to enhance caregiver resiliency. When I started researching this topic a few years ago, I thought it would be such a vital addition to our caregiving repertoire at Alzheimer's Orange County. But now, in the midst of this pandemic, the subject of resiliency is even more relevant than ever, just by virtue of us all being human beings together. So I know there are professionals out there. I thank you for what you do for a living. And if you're a family caregiver that's sitting at your computer with all of us, and you're taking care of a loved one with dementia, from the bottom of my heart, I so appreciate what you're doing. Um, I've been there. And I hope this presentation will bring you a little light and hope and help in your journey ahead. So here's what we're going to cover today. First, we're going to discuss, discuss what resiliency is, get a basic definition. Next, we will discuss the stress response and its relationship to dementia caregiving. And finally, we will discuss six things you can do to increase your resiliency on a daily basis, what I call the six Ps, positivity, practicing the feeling, playing music, addressing your own physical health and taking care of your physical health, finding meaning and purpose, and recruiting a posse or enlisting social supports. Clearly, in 45 minutes, we won't have time to go into depth on any one of these items. Today's presentation is intended only to introduce these concepts. And maybe, if you're interested, we can develop some of these individual concepts into future webinars. Just let us know. Our mission here at Alzheimer's Orange County is to help you. So whatever you need for your journey, you let us know. So let's start with the definition of resiliency. Resiliency is the ability to adjust to change, to keep going and not give up despite adversity, and to emerge a stronger person for it. 
So I want you to know two, notice two things about this sentence. First, notice that resiliency and adversity are partners. That means as a general rule, most resilient people have acquired their resiliency by enduring some kind of hardship. Second, I want you to notice the resiliency does not mean that you go through the adversity and then you bounce back to baseline um, after the exposure to adversity. Resiliency actually produces growth in you and me. Resiliency means you become a different, better person on the other side of adversity. You don't just go back to where you were before. So effectively, you're a different person at the end of it a stronger person. So far, that sounds good, right? So what is this resiliency factor? And is it something you're born with? Or can it be learned? Well, the good news is, scientists are now discovering that some people are actually born with genetic qualities. But um, the bottom line is, these qualities can be learned. No matter what you're born with, no matter what your genetic qualities are, um, no matter what how dire your circumstances are, you can take charge of building and developing your resiliency. So how is this relevant to dementia caregiving? The literature explains that dementia caregiving is distinguished from any other caregiving role and that it incorporates two things. The first is called sustained vigilance, meaning that when you're caring for a loved one with dementia, you're always on from the moment you wake up to the time you go to bed, and even throughout the night, you're thinking 20 steps ahead for this person who is gradually losing their ability to think for themselves. Second, the thing about dementia that, that distinguishes it from any other um, circumstance is that there's a lot of ambiguity and uncertainty in loving somebody with dementia. And you who've gone through it understand this. The cause is unknown oftentimes. There's no cure oftentimes. There's no timeline. And sometimes, like in the case of Alzheimer's, there's not even a way to obtain a definitive diagnosis until after death. And every day you are going through anticipatory grief over the loss of someone who is simultaneously here, but not here. In other words, the essence of the person is always there and you love that person, but your heart breaks because it's missing the parts that are going, the parts that are now gone. And so this combination of uncertainty, ambiguity, unpredictability, and sustained vigilance becomes very stressful to the mind and body of you, the caregiver. And left unchecked, it can lead to disease, whether psychological or physiological. So to understand what I'm talking about, what happens under these conditions, let's consider the basic physiology of the stress response. When the body is exposed to a dangerous stimuli or a threat, a portion of the brain called the amygdala reacts to the threat with alarm bells figuratively speaking, which then trigger another part of the brain called the hypothalamus to activate, activate a body-wide reaction through a network called the sympathetic nervous system. And as a result of this body-wide reaction, your body automatically readies itself for either fighting or running away from the threat as fast as possible. All of this is beyond your conscious control. Your pupils dilate automatically, your mouth gets dry, your respirations increase, heart rate goes up, muscles tense, blood pressure goes up, and your blood is diverted from organs that are less important to immediate survival, like your stomach. So in the short term, being able to run away or fight when you are faced with immediate danger is a good thing. It's what causes your foot to automatically slam on the brakes on the freeway when a motorcyclist cuts in front of you. It helps you survive. It helps the person on the motorcycle survive. But over the long term, it's not a good thing to be going through this flight fight uh, syndrome. 
This is because the same alarm bells in your brain that triggered that stress response also send signals to your brain and adrenal glands to release stress hormones like cortisol, norepinephrine, and adrenaline. And these chemicals are supposed to turn off after the removal of a threat. But when they're not turned off, like during times of chronic stress or cumulative stress, like what happens when you're caring for somebody with dementia, this chronic surging of higher than normal chemicals ends up suppressing the immune system, increasing your blood pressure, constricting your blood vessels, and putting a lot of pressure on your heart to work hard. It diverts blood away from your stomach, but allows for high acid production in your stomach. It interferes with normal cell replication. And this is why chronic stress can lead to things like anxiety, depression, insomnia, digestive problems, headaches, heart disease, sleep disruption, suppressed immunity, memory problems, even certain cancers can be uh, precipitated by chronic stress. So what do we do to increase resiliency? Well, enter the six Ps that I talked about before. These are the things you can consciously do to override the stress response and increase resiliency. Positivity, practicing a feeling, purpose, managing physical health, playing music, and finding your posse or recruiting a social system. For the sake of time, we're just gonna touch on each one I'll give you a brief description and I'll follow with a, an application that you can do. So the first one is positivity. What do I mean by that? What's so positive about dementia, right? Well, those with higher than average resiliency are also the ones who have reached a place of acceptance. They have what's called realistic optimism. They see what's good, but they also see what's bad and they've figured out how to focus on the silver lining. So coming to terms with your loved one's diagnosis is important. This coming to terms will take time. And honestly, as somebody who's both a professional and a family caregiver myself, I've listed the five stages, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's five stages of grief, and I can tell you, you go back and forth, up and down through these stages throughout the process. It's not an easy um, achievement to get to a place of acceptance. And there's no right way to grieve. Some days are more challenging than others. Be encouraged, you're not alone, it's very normal. In fact, the most painful epiphany, I think, is the day you realize there is nothing you can do to change these circumstances. Some of you remember that day, I certainly do. But when we can't change the circumstances, there is a freedom in being able to change one thing. And that's how we choose to view the circumstances. The word for that is perspective. So here's a quote, the reality of life is that your perceptions, right or wrong, influence everything else you will do. When you get the proper perspective, you may be surprised how many other things fall into place. So here's a little exercise in perspective taking to just kind of um, represent how powerful perspective is. Take a look at the image on the top left of your screen, the one where two figures are looking at sticks on the ground. If you look at the sticks from the perspective of the person on the left, you will see four sticks, right? But now take the perspective of the guy on the right and look down at those sticks and you're gonna see there's only three sticks. Interesting, isn't it? Now look at the element on the bottom right of the screen. If you take the perspective of looking at the elephant from the top down, how many legs do you see? Well, initially, your knee-jerk reaction is you're gonna say four until you check the number of feet. But if you look at the elephant from the bottom up, you think you see four legs until you try to attach them to the body, right? This is the way perspective and positivity work. The circumstances remain the same, but you choose to look at it from a different angle. That's what realistic optimism is all about. So how do we induce positivity on a daily basis? Well, there's two things we can do. The first is adjust your vision. 
And for dementia caregiving, that often means replacing the previous goal of task completion and productivity with a simpler goal of just enhance the quality of life day to day. For me, that became three things, more joy than not, elimination of pain, and elimination of fear. If I achieved those three things in my dad, I felt like I was having a good day. If he was wearing three layers of clothes and he didn't brush his teeth, but he had more joy than not, the elimination of pain and the elimination of fear, the day was a good day. The next thing you can do to induce positivity in your day is strive toward realist, realistic optimism. And what that means is accepting the diagnosis, seeing the challenges ahead, getting informed and taking action. Getting informed, by the way, will increase your confidence, which when coupled with realistic optimism motivates you into action. And we're going to talk about that in a couple of slides ahead. And finally, catch the words you're saying to yourself. Positivity is bolstered by positive words. Negativity is reinforced by negative words. If you say things like, I can't handle this, or this is awful, they will act like magnets in the universe, picking up more and more negativity. So catch your words. The second P is practicing a feeling. Now this is a fun one. Did you know that smiling actually produces happiness? It's true. The brain, it turns out, is easily smitten by a smiling face. In other words, seeing a smile, even if it's your own, can trick your brain into believing it's happy. This is because a smile triggers mirror neurons in the brain to internalize feelings which correspond with the smile. And so you feel happy. And here's the good news. Turns out laughter is good medicine after all. Research has actually found that smiling and laughing results in a measurable reduction in blood pressure, lowered heart rate, lowered salivary concentration of stress hormones, increased serotonin, which is a natural antidepressant, and so on. Laughter also releases endorphins, which reduce pain, boost immunity, decrease heart rate, increase brain connectivity, and even increase your ability to solve problems. So laughing actually makes you smarter, just in case somebody challenges you on why you're laughing so hard, right? So here's the thing you can do at home. If you smile in a mirror for 10 seconds a day, even if you don't feel like smiling, your brain will reduce these chemicals, including endorphins, which lead to all these resiliency boosting things including a distribution of chemicals that will help you. Um, okay, so the third strategy is playing music. Studies show that exposure to music, especially classical music, reduces the stress response. But if you're not a classical music fan, that's okay. The key here is to make a playlist of music that's relaxing and calming, music that is most consistent with the normal resting state of your body. Your heart rate is about 60 to 100 beats a minute. So you find music that's consistent with that, and you've got that normal resting state of your body. So what does music actually do to increase resiliency? Well, 25 minutes of classical music a day or music that you like will actually lower cortisol levels, increase dopamine, the feel-good brain chemical and hormone. It'll alter brain waves, reduce anxiety up to 65%, lower your blood pressure, reduce heart rate, and reduce pain. All of those things. As a bonus, we dementia caregivers can use, and even you professionals, can use music to enhance the quality of life for your loved ones with dementia. That picture is actually a picture of my dad with his headphones on. Um, studies have shown that music has the power to transcend the damage of dementia in your loved one um, by reducing agitation, anxiety, and aggression in your loved one with dementia. And this is because the area of the brain responsible for recognizing familiar music is somehow preserved from the ravages of dementia. 
In fact, MRI studies have confirmed minimal cortical atrophy and minimal disruption of the glucose metabolism in the same areas which light up when familiar music is played. Isn't that amazing? So the magic here is that as your loved one's stress level goes down, guess what? Yours will too. Increased peace in your household all because you were playing music. So the fourth P, we move on to taking care of your own physical health. For whatever reason, this is the one that gets sidelined. We caregivers routinely focus on taking care of other people, often to the exclusion of ourselves. And this is particularly true of dementia caregiving because things are so unpredictable and so unexpected. Today is different from yesterday. Tomorrow is different from today. And your world starts getting smaller and smaller as you start taking on more and more responsibilities for your loved one. So before you know it, you're canceling your own doctor appointments and postponing dental appointments. You're not eating very well. You're eating anything that's in front of you or not eating at all and not drinking enough and um, definitely not exercising. And then your sleep is, you know, you're constantly up worrying and wondering. So to achieve resiliency, though, you need to override the stress response, which means your body needs to be healthy. In other words, you need to put gas in the in the tank and you need to change the oil in your body. You can't run on fumes or you're going to blow out your motor. So to fuel your body, it's important to consciously do at these five basic things. If you do more, fantastic, but at least five basic things. Drink plenty of water every day and the experts will tell you it's eight glasses of water a day. Eat a variety of fruits and vegetables every day attend doctor and dental appointments on a regular basis, the dental appointments being every six months at least, go for a walk at least every day, um, check with your doctor ahead of time to determine what kind of exercise is best for you, and spend some time in nature. Nature, it turns out, actually interrupts that stress response. So, Essentially, taking care of your physical health builds resiliency, which results in reduced cell inflammation, increased blood flow to the brain, healthy blood pressure, memory boosting, improved mood, a restful sleep, and measurable reductions in stress hormones like norepinephrine, adrenaline, and cortisol, the uh, hormones we talked about before. So now the fifth P. And this is probably one of the most profound, and that is finding meaning and purpose. This subject is critical for building resiliency and probably deserves more time and attention than we have here. I say probably, but I think I probably should have not said probably because uh, this deserves maybe a week of uh, a presentation, if not um, more. Why is this critical for building resiliency? Well, people who have a clear sense of purpose know why they are doing what they're doing. It's the why that gives us the energy to do the what. So the bigger question then is, in the midst of adversity, in the midst of hardship, it is really challenging to finding meaning and purpose. Sometimes it's a lot easier after the fact to look back and say, I see what the purpose was, or the purpose I thought I was going in with uh, turned out to be something quite different. But there are some things you can do to strengthen your efforts to achieving a sense of meaning and purpose, to cultivating a sense of meaning and purpose. The first thing, I think, is to have a sense of conscious gratitude about anything and everything. Find things to say thank you for. Find things that make you say, wow, I really love that. Little things that you ordinarily would take for granted, like the sound of birds or the blueness of the sky or the cloud patterns or the vividness of green grass in the morning. You just look at those things in the midst of um, suffering and you you say thank you to those things and i'm going to add something else under gratitude that's not on your slide so you i want you to add this and that is a sense of forgiveness 
forgive freely. Forgive the guy on the freeway that cuts you off, that motorcyclist we talked about before. Forgive the gas pump that won't take your credit card and the automated, uh, automated phone system that keeps pushing you to somebody else and somebody else, but there's no human being to talk to. And forgive your loved one that is doing the best they can with what they've got, but sometimes it's so frustrating and sometimes you just feel so tired. And most of all, forgive yourself because you're doing the best you can. Every day is new and it can be tiring and it can feel so burdensome at times. And it's important that you forgive yourself and you see what you are doing. So find things to forgive. The third thing is identify your purpose. What brings you passion and joy? What were you born to do? What is the gift you bring others? What would you do even if you weren't paid? And I know it's really challenging sometimes to remember your purpose in the midst of a crisis. You thought you knew your purpose and now the things you loved and brought you joy, you're not quite sure anymore and, and maybe you know you don't have the time to do them. But this is where you go to the next point. And this is something, a concept that was introduced by Viktor Frankl called immersively imagining the outcome. For those of you who know Dr. Frankel, he was a neurologist and psychiatrist and also a Holocaust survivor who endured, I believe it was about four death camp experiences, including Auschwitz. He found that prisoners who were resilient, those who lived the longest, those who lived to the point of being freed, were the ones who had purpose and maintained hope for the future. And what they did to sustain themselves was to dream and to dream all the way to an imagined outcome. For Frankel, it was a book he started writing even before he was imprisoned. And it was a book he actually finished writing after being freed. And that book became one of the most influential books in history, Man's Search for Meaning. So you immersively imagine the outcome. If your gift is to help, you immersively imagine the outcome to that great purpose that you were destined to do. If your purpose is to write, you immersively imagine the outcome to that. If it's to nurture, if it's to teach, if it's to bring joy, that's what you immerse yourself in. And it may be something that we're going to integrate into the next topic um, that we'll get to. But again, that immersively imagining the outcome. How do you do this? Well, the secret to getting connected with this meaning and purpose means getting connected with your inner world and listening. Sounds all good in theory, right? But when you're hustling around trying to get services for your loved one and you're dealing with crisis after crisis and putting out fires, this can be pretty challenging. But somehow you make the time for it. This may come in the way of meditation. It may come in the way of simply slowing down your steps in prayer, in your faith community, in guided imagery, but you take the time to listen to your heart, your inner world. And you can do this while you're doing the other strategies we talked about. Taking a walk, you can do your inner listening. Listening to music, you can do some inner listening. Um, Taking time to be in nature, you can take some time to listen to your inner world. So this is really, really critical to getting through. The why, as we talked about before, gives you the energy to focus on the what. So now we move on to the sixth and final P, and that is recruiting your posse or widening your social circle. What this means is this. Isolation is an enemy of resiliency. I don't mean taking alone time because certainly we need that. We need time to listen to our inner world like we talked about. What I'm talking more about is that isolation where you're feeling cut off from the rest of the world, kind of like we are now with this pandemic. A lot of work on resiliency has been conducted on prisoners of war and those who especially survive solitary confinement. 
And what they'll say over and over again is the way they survived is figuring out a secret code, a way to communicate with people on the outside. The sense of community, that sense of not being alone is the key to resiliency. As an opposite, isolation can trigger the flight fight response, it can lower immunity, it increases inflammation, it increases negative thinking, and those negative thoughts just keep cycling and cycling and cycling without somebody on the outside saying, stop, I've got a better idea. <laughs> That leads us to the next point, which is just true because your world gets very small. Caring for somebody with dementia can get isolating. So this is why it's so important to recruit your posse or get your social circle wider. And the way you can do it is you talk with other caregivers in a supportive, under, supportive setting, people who understand what you're going through, people who can say, I've been there this is what I did. I don't know if it's going to work for you, but you might want to try it. That's normal. How you're feeling is normal. How you're reacting is normal. It's also important to schedule respite time and take time away. I know that's tough, but even if it's an hour or a few hours a week, it is critical to maintaining your resiliency and to building resiliency. The third thing is getting educated about what to expect in dementia caregiving. Remember, anxiety and stress is all about not knowing, that lack of knowing, the unpredictability, the uncertainty. So education will replace anxiety with confidence. And when the confidence is combined with positivity, you're going to experience lowered anxiety, which will then help motivate you for action. And the final things are feeding your spirit. Do things that bring you joy. Remember those three points that I mentioned about you know, enhancing the quality of life for your loved one. More joy than not, eliminate the fear, eliminate the pain. Well, that includes you. Do things that you enjoy, things that bring you joy. And then, of course, the last thing is it's um, in dementia caregiving, it's important to build a team. You can be the quarterback, you can be the CEO, you can be the director of events, but it's okay and it's actually a good thing to have a team working with you. Uh, in taking care of your loved one. So before I leave you, I want you to do something right now. I want you to take your pen and write down one thing that you that just resonated with you, something that you can start doing today, or maybe something you're already doing that you just got reinforcement for in listening to this presentation, something you can continue to do today to build your resiliency. And then I think uh, the last thing I want to give you is a couple of resources. Speaking of um, building a team and getting educated, here are some amazing resources, including us, um, that'll help you in your journey. The first is caregiver training videos. Those of you who've watched, um, uh, watched our presentations on, on dementia caregiving know we rely on these videos. The, Link is dementia.uclahealth.org. There's a number of caregiver education videos available um, that are just absolutely amazing. They'll give you the common response followed by a new and improved response. If you don't see your difficulty listed here, believe me, you can generalize some of the techniques used and use it in your own situation. The second resource is us, Alzheimer's Orange County. and there are so many volunteers, so many employees who are here to help you in your journey, to give you information, emotional support, education, um, resources, referrals, and the helpline is listed here. It's 844-435-7259. That phone number is available during business hours. However, you can leave a message and somebody will definitely call you back. And then the final source is the website, www.altsoc.org. And that's where you can find um, access to educational materials. You can see our calendar for upcoming workshops, community presentations. Anything you need to know is there. And if you can't find it, call that helpline, 844-435-7259. We're here to help you in your journey. 
Okay. Oh, my goodness. Dr. Galindo, we thank you so much. Uh, and everybody hang on because we are getting ready to go into uh, the question and answer portion of our presentation. So please take this time to put your questions into the chat box. And uh, before we go there, I just want to thank you, Dr. Galindo. Um, really on behalf of our Director of Education, Dr. Melissa Glabe, and our Vice President of Programs and Education, Mark Odom, our CEO, Jim McAleer, our whole organization is so blessed and proud to have you as part of our team. And uh, it's just wonderful to have you back. We have a record number of attendees today on the presentation, and I see amongst the names many friends, many wonderful family caregivers uh, that are part of our organization, as well as many of our professional uh, community partners and professional caregivers. So uh, we're all happy to have you here with us. And uh, before, again, also before we go into our q and I want to take a moment to thank our wonderful sponsors, uh, Chatterton and Associates, the Wealth Management Team, O'Connor Mortuary, uh, care choices, hospice and palliative services, as well as caring companions at home. And remind all of you who are attending that when we end the webinar today, there will be an evaluation which will pop up on your screen. You can submit that online. If for some reason you missed that, you'll also receive a copy in your email whether or not it's required for those of you that are rec uh, receiving a CE, but we'd love to get it from all of you, even if you're not receiving a CE, because we appreciate the feedback. And of course, all of, all of the partners and our organization are working hard to bring you topics uh, like the one today that are interesting, that can help you, whether you're working at home to care for someone or working in the community as a professional. So it's at this time that I'm going to go into the question box and um, see what we have for Dr. G, as I call her. First, we have a simple question. Would you please provide the name again of Viktor Frankl's book? Yes, I'd be happy to. Viktor Frankl's book is called Man's Search for Meaning. It's a wonderful, wonderful book um, and very, very helpful. Thank you, Dr. G. Um, let's see. The next uh, is not a question, but a comment from one of our viewers. Thank you so much. You reminded me of the importance of my perspective and exercising positivity. I came across this statement recently. If you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And that's from Michael. Thank you so much. Oh, that's beautiful. That's suitable for framing. We might want to include that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Can you then, can you uh, repeat that, Kim? To, because that's yeah. that's something people might want to write down. I think I'm going to see if I can cut and paste this into yeah. the chat box for everyone. Actually, I'm going to ask our technician to do that because I, I'm trying to do it and I'm making a mess of it. Um, the next one is not a question, but a compliment. Enjoyed this presentation. Thank you so much. There's other compliments as well oh. in the box for our, uh, for our presenter. And then a question, how much should you inform your loved one with dementia about COVID-19 and everything that's going on? Wow, that's a great question. You know, um, here's the tricky part about that. Remember how we talked about positivity? One of the challenges with persons with dementia is that as they're losing the uh, portion of the brain that's responsible for logical thinking, rational thinking, making sense of feelings, making sense of interpreting the world around them, um, it, it really depends on to what degree they're able to comprehend and retain that information and make sense of it. You may feel that you need to modify how you present the information. And I would say, since a lot of fear underlies behavioral issues with uh, in, in those with dementia, 
you want to be cognizant of not inciting fear in your loved one. And you want to make sure that you're not saying something that's going to escalate anxiety. Now, I know trying to get somebody in a moderately severe, uh, at a moderately severe level of dementia to wash their hands is going to be challenging, you know. But perhaps there's a way to do it on, um, uh, you know, in a way that doesn't inspire anxiety and fear. So I guess the bottom line is it depends on the stage. And it depends on to what degree you're going to be able to communicate these things without causing more harm. And that being that the person is now fearful and anxious and asking uh, questions and, and doesn't quite understand what it is that you're trying to explain. Great. Can, Thank you. Can you think of anything, Kim, to add to that? Because I know that you have a lot of experience in the area of communicate Kidding with uh, persons with uh, dementia, and maybe there's something that sticks out for you. Yeah, no, I think you covered it really well. Less okay. is best, and really during COVID, I think we all need to be on that uh, that news diet. Um, yes. Yeah, <laughs> really, because it's overwhelming for all of us. So I think yeah. you you covered that really well. And just in matters of communication in general, uh, we always want to point people. Uh, to our ed other education that's available. Um, our director of education has been doing Facebook live sessions on Tuesdays. Every Tuesday we have something and just this past Tuesday we had uh, Caring Conversations, for example, uh, featuring Melissa Glabe and Ben Allen and it was just great and so for uh, tips on communicating as well as all other issues that are salient for caregiving and tips on COVID, living in the time of COVID and caregiving in the time of COVID, uh, you can tune in to our Facebook page at uh, 10 o'clock. But in advance of that, make sure that you do uh, follow us on Facebook under Alzheimer's Orange County. And then you can subscribe to receive uh, alerts every Tuesday at 10 o'clock. You can join us for our Facebook Live education. We hope that you that that you will join us. So, um, thank you for that question. Uh, we have more. What suggestions do you have for families separated from loved ones in SNFs, skilled nursing facilities? Yeah, and that's a challenge that's relevant to um, what we're going through now. Um, the the thing that's critical is, do you remember how we were talking about that importance of social contacts and the elimination of isolation? And even with those prisoner studies, the, the prisoners that were in solitary confinement, the thing that kept them going was a method of communication with people on the outside. Even if it was like a code tap, they were tapping the floors and you know somebody on the outside would be able to communicate by tapping back. So for those who are isolated in, um, in SNFs and nursing care facilities, it's very important that they have access to things like um, uh, FaceTime, Skyping, uh, email, some way of accessing the outside, the outside world, and not just a steady diet of news and television, but uh, the community, people who um, are um, find them critically important and will remind them of how loved and relevant they are and um, and and that sort of thing. Kim, do you have any thoughts about that? Because I know Just, then you have this experience as well. Yeah, and I um, I'm sorry, I was reading. I had a little bit. Did you mention looking through the window? <laughs> I know that some of Please? our families have have been visiting through the window. Um, yes if they're lucky enough to be able to be on the ground floor or if there's a patio where they can sit and visit through the window, that's been ha happening as well. But um, mainly FaceTiming has, has yes. seemed to be, you know, helpful. Yes. But, uh, yeah. Um, will the workers from Owls Orange County be able to help individuals who live in Ventura County or provide information as well? And so I can answer that. Yes. Uh, we can uh, 
we certainly can provide information, but uh, I think most helpful would be to refer uh, families to the Alzheimer organization in their area. That's what we typically do. So uh, the person that asked that question, you can reach out to our helpline and we can see what we can do toward doing both of those things. There might be some print information we can give you, but more importantly, a referral to the Alzheimer organization in this specific area of concern. Uh, is it possible to get a webin is a recording of the webinar to pass on to those who may not have had a chance to hear it? We can certainly do that. All of our webinars are recorded uh, and archived on our web page. Uh, and if you can go back a slide for us, Dr. G, so that people can see again the website, uh, www.alzoc.org. It takes a little while because we have to do, uh, Michelle, our technician, does a little editing. And then all, you can find all of the, um, all of our archived uh, webinars under the heading of, you first go to programs and education, and then you look under the professional education tab, I believe. Uh, let's see. One of our caregivers wanted you to know, Dr. G, that it was an excellent presentation, particularly poignant today. Wow, I'm so glad you feel that way. That that means a lot, and I'm I'm so glad we're in this together. And and um, it, it was actually kind of fun being able to connect with all of you today. And then someone wants to know, <laughs> as if you had the power to do this. Caregivers are essential workers. Will we be able to receive ha hazard pay as professional caregivers? <laughs> That sounds we, great. We Who wish, don't we? <laughs> we would advocate for that. Definitely. I think both of us That's can awesome. see. Yeah, but um, we don't who, have to. What would be a good uh, resource to find out uh, information on that, Kim? Do you think oh, they could call the helpline or do you think yeah. um, maybe connecting well, with a legal advocate? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to. I'm going to just be pragmatic and say that we don't have the power to do that. We have the heart and the uh, the heart to say that we believe all caregivers should be paid much more than they are. Mm -hmm. we, have, we attach a lot of value to what you do, and we thank you so much, all of you. Uh, I know uh, we feel you're undervalued, and you, you give... Um, we don't know what we do without you, but we really don't have it in our power to to make a change in that area, although we would like to. So I don't know the best way to advise you on that. I maybe start with licensing or letters, advocate. I don't know. I'm feeling kind of at a loss here, but I well, do want you to. Yeah. And Kim, the nice thing is there's there's a number of attendees who are hearing this question, and one of them might know. And yeah. so the nice thing about Facebook and the nice thing about being part of this community is just like we talked about before, when you're connecting with people who are going through the same thing as you and you have mm -hmm. these kind of questions, you're able to ask people in support group settings or class settings and somebody may have answers to the things you're looking yeah. for. So even though Kim and I don't necessarily know the answer to that or can't provide the funds though we wish we could, there's probably somebody who knows which way to turn on that. Yeah, I think that especially during COVID, there are a lot of, there's a lot of realization that essential workers and frontline people uh, are people that are really putting their lives on the line during this pandemic. And there's more awareness that they really don't make that much money, but yet they're the ones that are all out there protecting others. And so, I will say the level of awareness has certainly risen during this latest emergency. So maybe now's the time, you know, to, you know, talk to, talk to others and to, you know, really raise the flag on this. So good luck, much luck with that. Um, and let's see, what else do we have? Uh, where do you refer caregivers for connection with other caregivers? 
So, Dr. G, you can, I can answer that, or you can yeah, answer I think, that. I think, I think that's one you can take. Yeah. So, um, for many years, our organization, Alzheimer's Orange County, has been very concerned with the social isolation that uh, Dr. G spoke of today. Um, you know, when she talked about building a posse, that's a big part of what we try to help you do here is to expand your support network and to meet other caregiving families who truly understand more so than, you know, the average friends in your circle, uh, what you're going through. And so to that end, we've developed programs where you can meet other caregivers. We have a program called Connect to Culture, where in better times, we were actually going out on outings to museums and music events and we do art events and all kinds of just simple fun things out in the community that were more than just events it were they were opportunities for you to make new friendships um, with others and so uh, and then of course support groups are just so you know ripe there for opportunities to uh, develop bonds with others and that giving and taking that mutual uh, support that is so critical to the process. Uh, even education provides wonderful opportunities to share and learn and support one another. So it's really what we're all about here at our organization is are those opportunities to commune um, with other caregivers and so even though we can't do that publicly anymore we're zooming <laughs> and we're doing webinars and we're providing those any type of opportunity uh, to connect everyone so uh, we encourage you to call our helpline and learn more about those virtual opportunities and we pray for the day when we can start to cautiously start you know resuming whatever normalcy we can but in the meantime uh, you know there's still these opportunities that we'd love to share with you so please do call our helpline uh, again our number is 844-435-7259 so Kim we're at 1230 okay so um I want to again thank our wonderful speaker. It's been very inspiring, I think, and uplifting uh, for all of our attendees. And I know I feel inspired as well. So again, I want to take our time, take this time to thank not only our speaker, but our sponsors once again for making this possible. And I want to remind you that uh, when I end the webinar, you will have that opportunity to fill out your evaluation and give us feedback. Um, before we go, I want to tell you a little bit about our webinar next month. It takes place on Tuesday, June 9th from 11.30 to 12.30. And um, the speaker is me, Kim Bailey. And we are going to be talking about the other dementias. It will be a discussion of frontal temporal uh, dementia, Lewy body dementia, and vascular dementia as they compare to Alzheimer's disease. And so um, we look forward, to, hopefully, to having all of you back then. And uh, once again, we thank all of you for being with us, with us today and wish all of you the best. And thank you for being with us today. Have a good day.